Good morning, Reagan. Good morning. Good morning, Madison. Good morning, Johanna. Good morning, Good morning. Johnny. People are always asking me why. Why do the same thing every year? Why not move on? But I say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Johnny? Present. I'm comfortable. I know the routine. United States of America and to the Republic. And I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty popular around here. I do really well in sports. No! No, not my house! Well, I'm just very successful here. Why would I go and mess that up by graduating? A B. But I mean, in the first grade, I may not know all the answers. D, 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 dog. E. The hours are longer. I hear they don't even have nap time. I mean, I just don't see the upside. Then first grade leads to second grade, second to third. It's really good. Then you're in high school reading boring books with no pictures. Three, four, five. But he was still, still hungry. Next thing you know, people expect you to get a job and give up summer vacation. <laughs> no, sir. I think I found my niche. Thank you very much. Home sweet kindergarten. Besides, I mean, what if I failed first grade? How humiliating would that be? Nope, just don't think I could handle that kind of embarrassment. And sometimes letter Y too. That was not a good choice. Very disappointed. Good morning. I found that this week, uh, going through some stuff in the office, and I thought, man, sometimes it's silly, it's funny, it makes me, I was having a hard time, I knew I had the mic on, and so I was like trying not to laugh. Um, but sometimes in our Christian walk, right? Man. We're comfortable. We don't want to get tested. This is just, I mean, why? Why do I want to be tested? Today we are in um, First Peter. We're continuing our series. For those of you that are visiting or haven't been with us on a regular basis, um, we're going through uh, First Peter as a, as a bit of a series. And today we are in chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. Um, last week, we were talking about submission to authority and being subject for the Lord's sake to the emperor. Um, people in leadership, people that the Lord has ordained the systems that we must submit to. Um, I had a conversation with Jean er, earlier in the week, and well, is there, like, there's got to be a breaking point. And there is. When the law of the land goes against the law of God. And, and we need to be very careful and be in tune with the, with the Spirit of the Lord as to which is which. When do we stand up for God? When do we take that stand? We have to be very discerning. You guys are very familiar with that word, discerning, being God-led. And so, yeah, there are, there are lines that uh, we don't always have to fall in line, but we have to keep our mission, our kingdom, that, and that's the question is, our citizenship to that royal priesthood, that holy nation should supersede any other. Sometimes that doesn't sit very well, you know, especially when we have strong feelings about our nation, right? But I'm not saying anything against this nation. It's I'm lifting that kingdom up above all. So that was last week. This week, we are in verses 18, uh, starting at verse 18 through uh, 25. And I'll read through, and we'll pause for prayer, and then we'll 
dig into what the Lord has prepared for us today. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, a reverent fear of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly, for what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. That's very important. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving, leaving you an example so that you might, you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Lord, we thank you for um, your word this morning. God, thank you for being concerned with our everyday lives, the mundane of the day. That you want to be represented well, even in that. From the tying of our shoes all the way up to some serious questions uh, about morality. You want to be well represented by your people, Lord. And we thank you that you allow us to take part and to represent you and then to be able to tell people about you. Be with us this morning, Lord, as we dig into the scriptures, God, that your word would shine through. Um, anything that, that I say that is not from you, that it would be forgotten and only what you have prepared for us uh, would remain. We love you, Lord, and we worship you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Just to be clear, the, the servants that Peter is talking about aren't like hired help. You know, it's not like they call the temp service and they bring someone over and you pay them to clean your house or something like that. These are slaves. There are slaves that are a part of the early church that Peter is writing to to encourage them. Dry. Does anybody have a bottle of water or something? <clears throat> Thank you, Mandy. <clears throat> um, and so keeping that... Thank you. I'm going to take a quick drink. Excuse me. Thank you, ladies. Um, that's better. So, keeping that in mind, the fact that this is the situation that Peter is speaking into, that it's not just, it's not the culture that we are accustomed to and, and the word servant like we are accustomed to it. This is an oppressive government that, that the church is a part of, that the early church is a part of, and Peter is saying, be subject to them. And then he goes on and he says, not only to the good and gentle, the ones that don't beat you too hard, 
but also to the unjust. Hopefully, we've all had experience at work, right? We've all had some kind of a job, right? Think on that. Like, when you've had good bosses and just some downright jerky ones. And, and that, and we, I mean, we have the freedom. We can make that decision. This isn't law that Peter is laying down. This isn't like, but there is a principle here. And, and I know I've quit at least one or two jobs because I didn't like my boss. And there's, there's freedom. Again, you can make those choices. The Lord will guide you and maybe he has something else prepared for you. But think on that for a minute. He is telling slaves to submit to the masters and not just the kind ones, not just the ones that beat you gently, but even the harsh ones. Let's continue on. Verse 19, for this is a gracious thing. When mindful, okay, when we're keeping at the forefront of our thoughts, God. When being mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. When we're keeping him, right, first in our minds, and we're going through difficult times. And we just, we continue on. Knowing that he's in control and we're representing him. What does that say about our trials? That, that video is, you know, it's a little bit funny and stuff. And, but it speaks to us about the trials that we face and facing them in such a way that if we're mindful of God, it brings him glory. One endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? Who cares? Like, what does it matter? What glory does that bring the Lord when we do dumb things and then suffer for them? Is it okay to use dumb? I don't know. I just used it. What credit, right? You, you don't even have the right to complain about the hard things that you've gone through because of some dumb choices. But, Peter continues, but, If when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is is a gracious thing in the sight of God. But when we go through those hard times and we just trust him, this isn't isn't like some of some of the teaching and preaching that we hear sometimes in, in the culture, like if you, if you accept the Lord and everything is going to be fine and dandy and it, you know, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. I don't think I can find this anywhere in the Bible. I mean, I've looked. I'm not. I don't have a PhD. I don't see it. I see this continued message. You will go through hard times because you're aware of how glorious and wonderful I am and because you love me. That's what the Lord is saying to us. You know that every bit of suffering that you go through, justly or unjustly, 
You will do it because you love me. So our, our, our mission, right? We continue to spread what? How great God is. So we need to get to know how great he is. We have to get to know him better. This right here that we do on, on Sundays, it is very important, very important that as a body of believers that collectively we come and we worship him, but this is not it. There is more to our relationship with God. So the only way, the only way that we can endure is to be aware of how, how great he is, how glorious he is, how magnificent he is. And when we come to that realization that he's a wonderful God, then we, we go through these things. But when you do good and suffer for it, you, en you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. 21, for to this you have been called. We might think maybe in our minds that I I'm the exception. Maybe he hasn't called me to this. Because going through easy roads and leaving aside the hard times and the suffering and pain, that seems like more my style. I just have this deep conviction like I shouldn't suffer. And then this conviction may come from the Lord. I mean... Why would he create me this way, right? For to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you. Leaving you an example so that you might Follow in his steps. When, when we ask ourselves the following question, just for a few minutes, indulge me for a couple of minutes, and, and, and think on this. What do I deserve? Culture, and even, like I said last week, even our own thoughts, we act in certain ways where we think, well, I deserve an extra scoop of ice cream. What do we deserve? Anybody brave enough to answer? hell and damnation. That's what we deserve. But he took, he took that for us. Amen. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. It's only by his grace that we get to take part. Not anything special about us. Yes, we may have talent, you know, instruments or speaking or... Honestly, this isn't, this isn't me. <laughs> when it came to giving reports in school, I was... I'm going to skip. I'll return my, turn in my report and skip the speech. 
this, this isn't, um, honestly, it's God. God leading But it's not because of anything f- special from us, but it's all because of his mercy and his grace upon us. He committed no sin, verse 22, neither was deceit found in his mouth. He did nothing wrong. <coughs> Tempted, but did not sin. And we see the devil coming to him and tempting him directly, and he, yet he did not sin. Going through the, the, the sufferings, the temptations, every bit of the stuff that we may face, he came and he was fully human. If you pinched him, it would hurt. And yet he did not sin. And living that perfect like life, he was the only one that could take the punishment for all of our sin. And so he did. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Did nothing wrong. 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He didn't strike back. Oh, that's a hard one for me. I wrestle with my kids, and we, and we you know, duke it out occasionally. I'm like, just don't hit me in the face, and we'll be all right. And so they wail on me you know, all over the place. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. When they came against him, he didn't strike back. He could have at any moment. I mean, we see it in the garden when they come to arrest him. All he had to say was, when they were looking for him, he said, I am, and knocked people down just by his voice. You don't think he could have gotten out of that, that pickle? And yet he didn't. He himself, verse 24, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. It's, it, it's a twofold thing. Die to sin and live for righteousness. That, that, should be, that should be our aim. That should be our goal. That's what our passion should be. To grow toward righteousness. Verse 25, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. I once uh, heard someone describe us human beings as dumb sheep. They need continuous care and redirecting and boundaries and rescuing because they go astray into the same trouble that they got into the last time they were rescued. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Again, that, that video, it, it just speaking on Growing, maturing, moving on from, you know, toddler stage 
as a Christian, we are called to grow. And the suffering that Peter talks about that we have been called to, that we must endure, that's final exam kind of stuff that moves us on to the next, the next grade. Um, do you guys remember two, three years ago? I think it was 2014. There was an Ebola outbreak, and it got crazy, and there was, you know, nobody's coming into the country, nobody, no traveling. There was, it was nuts, right? Um, a, a friend of mine, we were part of the, uh, the same church for a couple of years, um, he was pastor of discipleship and, and that sort of thing. Um, his mom was the nurse that got sick. Um, Dr. Kent Brantley was the doctor in charge, and Nancy Wrightbull was the assistant. Um, Jeremy Wrightbull is a friend of mine, his, her son. And he's been, uh, in, the, in this transition that we've been going through just been very encouraging. But it reflects the sun is a reflection of that character and that devotion to, to suffer for the Lord. Knowing how dangerous this disease was, they continued on. Doctors and nurses continued on the mission knowing who they serve, who they represent, who they will talk about, talking about Jesus Christ. They're, they weren't just taking care of the sick. They had an opportunity to tell them about the Lord. Nate, Saint, Jim, Elliot, all people, if you don't know their names, look it up. These are people that have fully bought into living and dying for Christ. So maybe you're not called to go to the jungles and find a tribe that is violent, and that might kill you for even getting close to their territory. Maybe you're not called to that. But what are you called to right here? When we adopt this mentality of living for the Lord, it will shape every bit of our life, every decision that we make, every action that we take. If you will indulge, I've got a poem. I, I'm not a poet, and I know it. Uh, it it's a little bit long, so please, I think it's very important. I won't do this often, I promise. One life till soon be passed. Two little, two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life till soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then, I can't see. <laughs> then um, that day, my Lord, to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ 
will last. Only one life. The still, small voice gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep in joy or sorrow, thy word to keep, faithful and true, whatever the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, twas worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamb of my life, if the lamp of my life has been burned for thee. What, what are we doing with our life? That, that is the question here. How are we serving the Lord? When we go before him and we're expecting to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, what, what are we going to bring to him? This is what I did with my life. I, I had a job and I had a family and I took care of them, and, which are good things. Don't get me wrong. Hear me clearly. Those are good things. But there's going to be some hard questions when we go before the throne of the Lord and bring a report. Only what's done for Christ will last. I, I invite you to come and pray. Um, don't be intimidated. It's not just about salvation and think that you're being judged. There's all kinds of reasons to come to the altar. If you are not able physically to come to the altar, that's okay too. Pray there and take as long as you want. But think on these questions. Think on this. How am I serving him and how is he in every bit of my life. That's what our prayer should be, moving towards righteousness. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. God, um, truly humbled, God, that, that we get to take part, that you've included us in your plans, Lord. I'm so grateful, so grateful for the suffering that you endured for our sakes. And we ask that you would lead us, Lord. Lead us in the direction individually that we should go, as a church that we should go, so that we may reach more souls for you, more people for you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.